Welcome back to another episode of the Build Show Podcast. That's right. This is my long format, guys. You probably know me from YouTube. My name is Matt Reisinger, and I'm a builder down here in Austin, Texas. But we've started a podcast so that we can really get nerdy. You think my videos are nerdy. This is where we really get the opportunity to dive in deep on all kinds of building and building science and the business of building related topics. And today is a great topic. I actually have with me a special guest who works with me in my Reisinger Build Company. And we're going to be talking about balancing the cost and performance aspects of a house. Meaning, how do we build a really well-built house, but also do that at a budget that's going to work for you or for your client's budget? With that being said, today's Build Show is sponsored by Builders First Source from the Rockwell Studios. Let's get going. Hey guys, I want to say a big shout out to our main podcast sponsor this year, which is Builders First Source. I've been a customer of theirs for over 20 years now, and man, I buy all kinds of stuff from Builders First Source. Now, if you're not familiar, Builders First Source and BMC merged not that long ago, just a couple months ago. And, so, and now between the two of them, we're talking about like over 500 locations serving builders and remodelers throughout the continental United States. You know, when I first started uh, working to those guys 20 plus years ago, it was in the Portland, Oregon market. And then a couple years later, I moved to Texas and started my custom building company. And I've got a sales rep through them that has been an absolute partner in my business and making sure that I've got bids and estimates on time, helping me when I'm first getting bids out. And then of course, when I'm actually ordering those packages, let's say a window package or a framing package for my job. So if you're not currently a customer, I highly recommend you reach out to those guys get an account set up and find a sales rep locally in your area. All right, friends, let me introduce you to Steve Leesum. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. So Steve is my COO. Uh, move up just a little bit, Steve, so we can make sure we hear you out of the mic. Steve's my COO. How many years have we, we've been working together now, Steve? Well, we didn't know we were working together 11 years ago when I was building my house. <laughs> and, uh, and a local architect was taking credit for a lot of these ideas. <laughs> which I think you all jointly developed, it's yes, fair to say. Indeed, indeed. And then we actually met each other and uh, started working together five years ago. Amazing. You've been such a valuable team member to me, Steve, and, and so much of my business has been tran transformed by you taking that spot as a chief operations officer. Steve, we're talking about a, a topic today that you and I have had a lot of offline discussions about, and that's really balancing cost versus performance on a build. Uh, and, you know, I think most people, the majority of America, when they think about either a new build or a remodel, they're focusing on design and floor plan and elevation and finishes, all, all the pretty things. You know, what do I see when I walk in the front door? Is it an open floor plan? What are the color schemes? Um, but you and I and most of the people listening to this podcast care about a lot more than just the looks, don't we? Oh, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's almost frustrating. Because I, I call all the things you just mentioned, it's the eye candy. Mm -hmm. and, and look, all of us want a beautiful home. I, I, I never have met anybody who came in and said, I'd like an ugly house. And, and after you see it ugly on the street, I want to see it really ugly on the inside. <laughs> that's, not it. that's not the way we are. However, that appears to be the major focus. Yeah. And if you have all the money in the world, you can have a great house that is absolutely gorgeous in every way yeah that's right performance and looks absolutely but what if you're having to constantly make those trade-off decisions while you're doing the thing that is probably the biggest financial decision of your life and that's building a home yeah that's right steve i get gigged for this a lot uh you know when i post stuff on instagram like i posted uh, some pictures today on my garage door uh which i thought was actually a pretty affordable setup you know it's probably a $2,500 garage door with a $500 opener. Uh, and one of the comments was, oh my gosh, Reisinger, you're always, uh, you know, so expensive. I wish that I could afford any of the stuff you talk about. And I thought, actually I responded back, you know, I could have easily picked a five or $10,000 door that was an all wood door. But yet my um, desire was for a door that looked good, but also really performed well. Uh, and so my garage door is an R17 insulated door with double pane insulated glass uh, windows at the top. Uh, it also performs really well because it's really quiet. I've got a side mount uh, LiftMaster opening. 
But I think that that door uh, in that comment from that person was something that is worth talking about. Like, how do we balance that performance versus price? Uh, and in fact, you know, I could have probably spent a thousand dollars on a door and an opener, a, a steel door that's uh, what they call a hollow door that doesn't have any backer on it, no, no insulation. Uh, and a standard uh, opener probably would have been, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks installed. So what I paid was almost double what is quote unquote standard maybe in a new Texas house. And yet my performance is at a, you know, a whole nother level. It's 10 X what that door would perform for me. Let's extrapolate that, Steve. Let's talk about energy efficiency. Um, how do you see when it comes to energy efficiency, how do people balance that cost and performance for a house? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you know, when we talk about the comments we get, a lot of people are also interested in passive homes and off the grid homes. Mm -hmm. Off the grid homes are generally passive just yeah. because you want to use the least amount of energy if you're not going to be connected. That's right. But uh, that's kind of the extreme. I think that energy efficient homes can be done as in a, in a careful balancing act. Mm -hmm. And that means that there are, and you know, certainly this is talking about build, building a new house. If we're retrofitting or remodeling a house, there's limitations. You and I were discussing about that earlier and we can, we could jump over to that. But if we're talking about a new home, uh, should you do everything possible to make it as energy efficient as possible? Or should you do things that make financial sense mm -hmm. and make it somewhat more energy efficient. And a lot of that has to do with your pocketbook uh, size and your goals. But yeah. I think too many people focus on wanting to go full passive. I want to strongly salute people for wanting to build an energy efficient home. If for no other reason than uh, I was doing some research the other night, if you look at greenhouse gases and global warming and how those two things most people believe are related, uh, automobiles are responsible for about 15% of the greenhouse gases. Homes, on the other hand, are responsible for a significantly larger amount of greenhouse gases, meaning that they're less efficient and they also just simply consume more energy in yeah. a less efficient way. I've heard like 50% oh, uh, yeah. between commercial and residential buildings. Uh huh. And so, if we, if we just knock that down by 10%, mm -hmm. we've made an enormous contribution to the environment, which we're all worried about. So why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So, so, you know, where do you start? And obviously a lot of it has to do with where the house is. Well, let's start with uh, climate for sure. But also I want to ask you, you know, you built not that long ago, really in the scheme of things, maybe a dozen years ago, you built a new house uh, and used a lot of the things that we talk about on the build show regularly in terms of technology. How much above code did you build to when it comes to energy efficiency in your house? And can you give me a couple examples? Yeah, um, I started with the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Texas, the, the sun is fearsome. Yep. And uh, it just made sense to me. And, you know, I have an engineering background. It, if I, the, the more heat I can stop from ever getting into that house, the less heat I'm going to have to use the mechanical system to, to get rid of. That's right. And so that was a big focus area. And it turned out that there were two or three really easy, inexpensive things that don't cost as much that I was able to do. So the first thing is, look at the reflectivity of the roof. Now, your new house has a dark roof on it. Yeah, it does. I went black on my roof. Absolutely. Uh, my house has a galvanized steel roof on it, which is... Which you know, honestly makes a lot more sense than black it's in this silver. climate. It's yeah. very reflective. The only more reflective roof is a white roof. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was, as I said, I'm going to reflect as much heat away. Yep. The second thing, and this was one of the things that we've talked about and is one of our practices with our roofing uh, uh, applications, is we have uh, belting strips that are what the roof is uh, connected to. Mm -hmm. So we hold the roof about... Three quarters of an inch. Three quarters of an inch above the the sheathing. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that, I've got air circulating underneath that roof. So any heat that gets through that roof is now going to go into an air cavity, which is going to transmit it less effectively. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 
Uh, so that was the second thing. That wasn't a big upgrade. Mm-hmm. So I could pick any color roof I wanted. So I picked one that's highly reflective. And then we installed it in a slightly more complex way, but it's not that much more complex. Hey, Steve, let me interject real quick. You know, you mentioned something that I love, which is, you know, in Texas, the sun is fierce. Uh, And I've heard this analogy several times from lots of different people. But basically, you know, in Texas, how does a cowboy stay cool on a hot day? Well, they wear (laughs) a big wide brim hat. You know, they wear a sombrero, a cowboy hat. And, uh, and the fight is in the roof when it comes to uh, southern U.S. houses. That sun is relentless and bringing that sun's heat, uh, both conduction and convection and radiation, to that house. So anything we can do with that wide brim hat to stop that is really smart. And I've been over to your house several times, and you've got a nice big overhang on that Texas house of yours. <laughs> yeah. So you've got a good sombrero going. Well, and we did little things. Uh my house has a lot of windows. Mm-hmm. That can be negative, yeah. uh, particularly because a fourth of the house, and actually much more of it because it's an east-west orientation, front and back, there's a lot of glass on that house. We even looked at where trees are, mm-hmm. how they would grow, and how they would give the afternoon sun, they'd give some shade over the windows where we put them. That's now, smart. Yeah, it's smart, but you know, do people really take time to think about that? Not very often. Yeah. Third thing we did, oh, and I want to I want to throw in one other thing. We uh, we used a, a water and ice peel and stick. Mm-hmm. Now I went out and uh, just recently compared some roofing subcontractors for us, and a lot of them are not doing a water and ice peel and stick across the entire roof. They're mm-hmm. doing a a synthetic uh, membrane that's attached with staples or tacked on. And then only around the gutters, the valleys, and the penetrations do they use the more expensive uh, peel and stick. So on this particular roof, it was, uh, I think the to upgrade it to all peel and stick, fire, water and ice, three grand. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, about a 2,200 square foot roof. Yep. That's... Uh, that represented maybe a 15% cost increase over the whole roof, but a much better way to, uh, I mean, look at look at the roofer. He doesn't want to come back there and have a warranty claim. That's right. So anywhere he knows water is going to come in, like a gutter mm-hmm. or a valley, he puts down the good stuff. That's and right. then he puts the cheap stuff down to keep his price down. So there's just a little upgrade. Now, that's not an energy efficiency upgrade. It's a maintenance upgrade, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah, or a long-term durability upgrade. Yeah, too, long-term right? durability. Well, you that's looking, really. You're looking at that house not as a, hey, I'm going to live here for three years. What's the least cost I can do? Right. Which you would have put a shingle roof down mm-hmm. had you thought that way. But instead, you said, hey, I'm going to be here a while. Yeah. I planned on being in this house for some years. So right. let's make sure we build it right. And then the last thing I did was I went with... Um, foam insulation 12 inches of it which is a lot yeah but that's underneath that whole roofing system Mm -hmm. and uh i will tell you it was so interesting to me when we were building that house i could go to that house on any day on the hottest day of the summer and it refused to get hotter than about 85 to 88 degrees inside that's great now the windows were open and it's got a lot of breeze Mm -hmm. but the fact is we stopped the sun yeah and uh uh, Peter Pfeiffer and I tried to calculate it, and we 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 ran the numbers on it. And I think we felt like we were stopping ninety six percent of the sun's energy with that roof. That's amazing. It Peter is. Peter, by the way, is a local architect who not too long ago just uh, got inducted as a fellow in the uh, AIA. So he's now Peter Pfeiffer, comma FAIA. Oh, neat! Very smart building scientist and uh, great architect with Barley and Pfeiffer Architects here in Austin, Texas. Let's so your so your roof was highly insulated. You had a reflective roof. Um, you probably added. Um, my guess is, Steve, if you did twelve inches of open cell insulation in your roof, you probably could have gotten away with seven or eight inches uh, to meet code, which would be uh, if you're insulating in the um, in the vaulted ceilings, you could get away with R thirty to meet code. I bet you probably went closer to an R38 or an R40 on your roof. Mm-hmm. Um, any idea on what that cost additionally at your time of building the house to go to that extra, you know, R10 of insulation in your roof line where you knew it would make a big difference to you? You know, I can't remember. I'm putting you on the spot. I know, I know. No, no, I just can't remember. <laughs> but you know what? It wasn't much. Yeah. 
It really because first of all, they're already the trucks coming. Uh, you're going to buy a little more material, and yep. you're going to spend a few more hours of labor. But that's it. And think about you ten years later, going, "Oh gosh, I'd really like to add some more insulation to my roof." How easy would that to be on your house today to bring the foam crew back and add another, yeah, uh, you know, four inches <laughs> well, of foam? Yeah, that's not happening. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, when I think about that roofing system, oh, and one other thing, and this is this is an energy efficiency, but it's capital efficiency. The roof I uh, used has the striations in it so mm-hmm. that it resists hail damage. Yep. Now, uh, I have a fairly healthy insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance policy, and I get a discount because of the kind of roofing material I use, mm-hmm. the gauge of the steel and the way it's designed. Class A fire rating. Yeah. So, uh, you know, once again, I'm getting some money back for doing what is also an energy efficiency approach. That's right. I so, like it. so just as simple as a thing as your roofing system, there are trade-offs. Now, I could have put a composition shingle roof on that thing, and it wouldn't perform like this. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't look like this does. Yeah. It would have been half the cost. And it probably wouldn't have been half as comfortable, too, frankly. Absolutely. And I would have ended up buying that roof with increased energy costs over the lifetime of the house. Plus the uh, the first hailstorm that runs through, you're going to be replacing that roof. That's right. So, so that's one, I think, you know, obviously it's... Uh, it's something in Texas we're going to deal with and in a lot of the South mm-hmm. because you have that intensity. But, you know, in other climates, there are other things that you can do um, to make your house uh, more of a, a, a building envelope that you trust and is designed for us to manage. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where my mind went. I want to be in control of what's going on inside that house. Makes sense. Uh, and and so that's kind of where I focused it. And and if you think about it, think about the other things that uh, that can affect that. Your mechanical system, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about that in a moment. I think those are huge. Uh, your your lighting. Uh, one of the things I didn't do is I didn't do LED lighting. Hmm. It was you know it hadn't really hit yet. Yeah, not twelve years ago there right. wasn't much. But I tell you what, I'm already replacing every incandescent bulb in that house with an LED. Mm-hmm. Better service life, less heat. Yep, it's definitely worth the cost. Yeah, and it's a no-brainer today. It really is, and and that's something. So today, if you're building new and you're not doing LED lights, you have that ship has sailed. Yeah, you missed that. One. <laughs> that's for don't, sure. D- don't not do that. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> you know. Talk to me about your walls, Steve. What'd you do different or what did, I, I actually don't know. I wasn't around when you built that house. What'd you do for wall insulation? Did you do anything crazy with advanced framing or insulated headers or exterior insulation or anything like that? Uh, we did, uh, no, not really. Okay. Uh, we did uh, We did do a spec on, so here's the way the outside walls look. Uh, you have your sheathing, a Tyvek wrap, and mm-hmm. we used a, a commercial Tyvek wrap. Okay. And then uh, a half-inch blue foam board. Ah, okay. And that's basically what was on the outside. And then on the inside, we did wet rock wool, and we blew it in. Okay. And uh, could have found it. I bet it it was cellulose, damp-blown cellulose. Yeah, it was, damp-blown cellulose. So we thought about that, and we thought about going ahead and doing the full foam. And uh, I've always kind of wished I did, honestly. Yeah. It was a lot more expensive. To do the foam? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so this was a less expensive way to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we also focused a lot on the window installs. Mm-hmm. And we actually used four different tapes um, on the nailing fins and had an absolute process written up that we had to coach the framer through mm-hmm. on the window installs to get the tapes put on correctly. Well, I would say, Steve, you spent your money wisely because you spent your money on water uh, intrusion and making sure that you absolutely would not have a water issue. And then you said, okay, I'm not going to spend some money on my um, uh, on this extra insulation type for my walls going from damp blown cellulose to uh, open cell foam. And I, I would say you probably spent your money wisely that additional money to do spray foam in your walls maybe it would have contributed a little bit to air tightness on your house Um, but with open cell foam i would say it probably didn't do it would not have done a whole lot more for you Uh, and having spent the really the time and effort to make sure your walls were totally waterproof your windows are watertight you had sill pans under those windows that was really wise that was money well spent 
Yeah, and that, you know, every once in a while you're going to make one of those trade-offs. And I think that's fair. And uh, we, you know, that's just, it has to do with the size of your pocketbook. Yeah. And where you want to spend the money and, and how far to the, you, you, you draw a graph a lot where you talk about, you know, what's the cost to get to 95% perfect, 96, mm. 97. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you get up above 97, it's just ridiculous. The cost versus perfection scale. Uh -huh. It's, so. uh, you know, on the, on the bottom axis is, co axis is cost and the top axis is perfection. And as you draw that line going up, uh, you know, the line gets incrementally closer uh, to perfect on the right, but the costs go way up. Uh, and this is a discussion we have a lot in our, uh, in our manager meetings is, you know, how do we convince that client to spend a little more for us uh, to do things right behind the scenes compared to another builder who maybe won't do things quite as well as we might behind the scenes? Uh, and I think that getting to that, you know, 95, 96, 97 percent perfect is the right way to do it. And then beyond that, uh, you're really spending money on magazine perfection. You know, mm -hmm. those ultimately perfectly crafted and detailed houses that only the one percent of the one percent really can afford to build that way. Mm hmm. I think that I think the other area that it was really important to me to have a tied house because I wanted to be in control of the inside atmosphere, mm -hmm. and uh, that kind of brings us to the mechanical system. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, I uh, I wasn't going to do Mitsubishi mini, mini splits. Uh, didn't need to. I have a kind of a more traditional hill country type home, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew I was going to be dealing with a lot of heat. Yep, and I wanted high efficiency. So the first thing I uh, looked at was a conditioned attic space. Mm, it's huge. Uh, going ahead and bringing in fresh air mm -hmm. in order to manage the uh, healthiness of the environment and keep the house feeling fresh and clean. Yep. What kind of filtration uh, was I going to do? And then um, lastly, and this is something that a lot of people don't think about, and it's something we do on all our homes, is uh, hard ductwork. Mm -hmm. Sealed hard metal ductwork huge when you look at what it takes to push air through the flex duct that you see in all these homes it's ridiculous totally and it's just it's just burning energy mm -hmm. to do it whereas if you put the hard ductwork in you're going to be able to move more air more efficiently and then you seal it so now you're not going to leak it and i'm going to have all of it in a conditioned attic where it's it's cool and comfortable and if you ever needed to clean that ductwork, uh, you know, it's really easy to make a rip or a tear when you're cleaning uh, flex duct. Oh. Uh, and typically flex ducts is installed in all kinds of ways and it's pinched and it's shoved and it's, uh, you know, people are crimping it as they're putting it into places. So knowing that you've got that rigid metal trunk line means that you're actually going to get the air delivery that you're supposed to get per your manual J in each one of your rooms. Uh, and every time you're at your house, Steve, it's totally comfortable. And you can tell the difference between a well-built house that has a good uh, duct delivery system and one that the duct guy showed up and said, okay, the bid was for a four-ton house. Let's figure out how we're going to run this thing. Yeah. And, I mean, look, flex duct is cheap. It's easy on the contractor. Mm -hmm. It is not a reliable way to move air through your home and particularly Agreed. in texas where uh you're you're gonna be uh, the our air conditioner started running a month ago mm -hmm. on well-built homes yeah that's right they may never stop almost on other homes that's but true. on well-built homes you know we were running air conditioners over a month ago and we'll be running them until heck i've had to run an air conditioner on thanksgiving mm -hmm. um so so that's part of it uh obviously we zoned it Mm -hmm. uh, we took into account some little things like uh, how this particular house was going to be used. And that went into the design. So the upstairs of my house is, I, I'm an older guy. I got children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I don't have kids living at home. They're living there on a weekend when they come to visit us. Yep. So our house is designed for my wife and I to live on the first floor mm -hmm. and for our family to occupy the second floor when they're in town. Smart. And uh, So you keep the upstairs probably barely conditioned most of the year, right? That's right. Yeah, we keep it at about 78, 79 degrees, keep it dehumidified and because uh, I don't want anything growing up there. I mm -hmm. want it to all be kept clean and neat. Uh, but 
But Steve, on the cost versus performance scale, what I'm hearing you say is you really lean towards traditional equipment, not you know some of the Mitsubishi mini splits that I use in my house, where I've got low static here and I've got mini split heads there, and you know a fairly complicated system. You've got two units: an upstairs unit and a downstairs unit. They're traditional, you know, high static pressure, high flow units. They got installed well with good trunk lines. You've got good filtration. You've got good humidity control with a separate dehumidifier, and then that's it. You know, you didn't go. You didn't go to the nth degree. You went probably a degree or two beyond what most people do, and that's it. Is that yeah. is that kind of correct? I think so. I think with with the exception that we did build the house tight enough that we had to introduce outside air, mm -hmm. and uh, so we do have some little Linux controllers on each system that. Uh, that open the duct work up from the outside ingestion of the air and you know about 15 minutes out of every hour unless uh we're actually measuring temperature and humidity outside before we start pulling that air in hmm. but it makes those decisions and it, it introduces that uh fresh air into the home filters it first and it can do that whether or not the systems are running and so that gives us uh, a good uh outcome in terms of keeping the house feeling fresh and normal and uh, kind of holding it right on the temperature. I like it. What's next when we think about cost versus performance, Steve? What else can you think about? Uh, we talked about energy efficiency. We talked about health. What's the next thing to consider when we're thinking about this? Well, I mean, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, is water heating. Okay. Uh, Peter and I went round and round on this. I gave him, uh, you know, we live out on Lake Travis mm -hmm. and uh, so there's lots of boating, there's swimming, there's all kind of stuff going on in the summer, lots of people coming in and out. But you're in effect in the country, right? Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things I see is, is that it's very easy to be in a situation, and this was my design point, where the upstairs of the house, which is where my guests are all, you could have it being unoccupied all day. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly within an hour and a half, 12 people need to take a shower. <laughs> Uh, then downstairs is different. Just my wife and I live down there. Uh, the second thing is I, uh, we don't have natural gas. Mm -hmm. So you have to use propane if you want a gas-fired water heater. Yep. Propane is an expensive fuel. Yeah, it is. And uh, I do have a propane tank buried in my front yard, and uh, I use it for running our gas grill. And I'll talk about uh, on my mechanical system. Uh, my wife doesn't like heat pumps. She doesn't like that cool air coming out of the vents, mm -hmm. even though they work great. Upstairs is a heat pump. It almost never comes on because my downstairs heater is a very high efficiency propane heater. Mm -hmm. And so think about it. I heat the downstairs. It immediately goes upstairs and warms that area up. So we're very comfortable. And if we need a little boost, that heat pump will come on outside. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but generally the whole house is running on that okay. and so uh that was just taking normal kind of equipment now we did did do very efficient equipment uh but it's just bryant mm -hmm. uh one's a big air conditioner one's a big heat, heat pump the other thing though was on hot water uh i went with um big well insulated glass tank spun plastic uh water Re heaters ream marathon right ream marathons yeah and upstairs is a 80 gallons mm -hmm. and the downstairs which has the utility room the kitchen and our bedroom and bath is a 50 gallon wow so that 50 gallon she's running you know a lot uh upstairs uh i actually have a energy management system that i can use my phone with it's turned off most of the time. Oh, is that right? You've yeah. got a link to your phone so you can say, hey, I've got company this weekend. Let me pull out my phone and turn on my upstairs water heater. Right. I can literally pick up my phone right now, and that house is 37 miles from here. I'll turn that water heater on. How cool is that? What's the system? Do you know what you use to go ahead and uh, do that remotely? It's called Smart Home. It's basically just a little Linux server, but, you know, I'm kind of a geek. And yeah. I yeah. can program those kind of things That's myself. so cool. So uh, it actually has its own iPhone app or an mm -hmm. Android app. And uh, it's a pretty well, it's called, uh, I'll have to look it up. I can't even remember what it's called, but I've got a little computer in there and it's been running 12 years. I want to say that Ream on some of their newer models now, Steve, has a Wi-Fi controller that you could do that now through the Ream app as well. That'd be cool. But 12 years ago, there was nothing like that that oh. I've seen in the market. 
No, there wasn't. And uh, and to have a secondary house that you know, hey, I'm you know I'm driving from my house in Houston to my lake house in Austin, uh, and I should turn that water heater on uh, four hours ahead. So when I get there, I got a hot shower. How cool is that that you could you could do that remotely, or even uh, you know I want to check on my mother in law's house. Uh, I know that she's uh, been in the hospital. I want to make sure that our water heater is running. I'm going to get on her Wi-Fi for her water heater and make sure everything's good so that when she gets back home, she's good to go. Yeah. I think more and more manufacturers are seeing the benefit of that. Even my garage door these days, uh, I got a LiftMaster garage door at my house with a MyQ app, which is their app. It's all standard. It's all built in. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, and I can open and close my garage door remotely from my phone. But even better, uh, I've got it on a, uh, a system that I set up through my key where if that garage door is open at 9.30 p.m., it automatically closes it every night because my kids often forget to close the garage door. <laughs> and then I forget to go in the garage and check and see if they've closed the garage door. So those kinds of apps uh, are really handy. And I'd like to see more and more manufacturers come out with that uh, type of system for us to remotely check on things. Uh, change settings, start and stop it from an energy per energy efficiency perspective. Uh, I'd like to see more manufacturers come out with that. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I think the way that the industry is going, you know, a lot of the houses we build have very sophisticated low voltage management systems in them. And uh, I think everything's going to go Wi-Fi. Yeah, however, this is probably a whole other podcast. Maybe I should schedule this one. Uh, like at my house under construction, uh, or I should say my current house, I had a, uh, I had a, I don't want to name the manufacturer cause I don't want to throw them under the bus. I have a whole house control system that does audio, mainly audio and visual. They can also integrate shades and some other stuff. It was kind of expensive to put in. It's been fairly jicky, which is my, uh, my madism term for not reliable. Uh, and every time a tech comes back to work on it, it's 150 bucks an hour. Right. And I've heard from some of our homeowners that I put those same systems in. Oh, I abandoned that because it was a pain, and I hated, I hated the bill, even though I could afford the bill, right, to have a guy come out for three hours and update the software or whatever. So on my new house under construction, I abandoned that and said, look, I'm only going to use the software from the manufacturer. So Halo, which is my lighting in my house, has their own app that will kind of set up the system will do whatever it needs to do can do some scheduled lighting but it's just the halo app it's not the one app does all i'm also using uh, sonos for my audio at my house i've used sonos wireless speakers in my house for years the app's super reliable everything in my new house is sonos now i don't have some app that controls everything which means yes i'll have uh, probably two remotes or three remotes by my TV, that's okay. No, you're Ma just going to have your phone. Or I'll have Everything's my phone. Everything's going to be on your phone. That's right. That's right. And um, maybe I'll have my spare phone in the uh, living room on a charger so that that's my remote if I need it, my yeah. old iPhone, let's say. But see, this is a business opportunity. Somebody ought to make uh, what's referred to in the IT world as a mom, a manager of managers. Mm -hmm. So somebody's going to create a unique app that manages and presents all those apps that are on your phone on a single pane of glass. And, and be that'll cool. be the next step. Yeah, that'd be cool. And it'll say, okay, I'm gonna go out and acquire all these disparate systems that you're using to manage your house. Yep. And I'm not gonna change them, I'm not gonna replace them because those manufacturers keep them maintained. Yep. But I'm gonna give you a single pane of glass view. And that that's what I expect to see next. They did that in the IT world 20 years ago. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, no. Besides the, uh, you know, there's several of them that make it uh, now, but they're bringing them into their platform so that now it's their button that you press right. that then does a, uh, what do they call that? Not a queue, but a, uh, uh, a, not a query. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it runs a- Poll. It, it polls them? Polls them or it runs a, basically runs a program uh, that says, okay, when this person presses this button, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Uh, so script. script, the word is script. script. Thank you, Alex. There it you runs go, a script. Alex. I couldn't think of it. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's, what's been jicky at my house is mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the, for instance, the all off button on my remote, 
uh, through that manufacturer that I had to pay $400 for that's now not working and said brick in my house. Uh, the all off button stopped working. So mm -hmm. then I had to find the remotes anyway. So then why turn it on if the all off button doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> the script broke. Who knows what happened? Yeah. But you know, coming back, we were talking water heaters. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to finish. Here's what I want you to know about the water heater. These are traditional old water heaters. Now, they're never going to rust. Mm -hmm. They're never going to fall apart. And they're on the second floor of my house in my machine room, which is where the mechanical systems are also. Yep. Yep. But what we had to do is we had to calculate how many showers of how much duration can an 80-gallon water heater do mm -hmm. in a given amount of time, including its recovery factor, which is how fast it's reheating water. Yep. And so we set a goal. We said we want 12 eight-minute showers. And we want to do that. And there's three bathrooms up there, mm -hmm. each with a shower. And so you can have three going at any one time. So there's four in concurrency. And that's how we designed the, the, the hot water heater size. Yep. So what did we save? Well, first of all, I've got a water heater up there that's rarely on or using anything. Second, it's electric, so it's really easy to control. Mm -hmm. Third, I don't have gas going to it, so I'm never worried about a gas leak in the house. And lastly, it's a very good water heater. Uh, it's got a very long, useful life, and I'm not using it real hard except when I have company. And ultimately, I think your point is it's not the most efficient choice, but yet it's probably the most durable, long-lasting, best choice. Yeah, right? it's the best cost. Yeah, it's the best bang for your buck. Yeah, and, and those ream marathons run about a thousand bucks, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing you did on yours, which I think is smart, is you put a. Uh, full port ball valve drain on them <laughs> yeah. to make it really easy. If you walk into Steve's uh, upstairs attic, there's his marathon water heater and he's got a full, um, you know, quarter turn ball valve on the bottom that's running with a piece of uh, copper right into a drain so that every, how, how often do you do that? Every six months or so? Well, actually I just do it once a year on the, on the big one cause it's not used that much, but yeah, I, I flush it out every year. And, and it just opens that valve and any scale, any junk that's on the line, anything that's accumulated at the bottom of the tank just flushes right out. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that was a, that was a whole series. Of, I mean, I started that process thinking, oh, I gotta have uh, tankless water heaters. Mm -hmm. I can have unlimited hot water heater unlimited hot water yep and everybody was yakking about it you were talking a lot about them for sure and so that's where i was headed then i ha then i hit the first clip level well i'm gonna have to run it off of propane mm -hmm. <laughs> not sure that was a great you know suddenly the uh you know so then i said to i stepped back from that for a moment i said what am i really trying to accomplish here I mean, do I really want the ability to take a 90-minute shower without running out of hot water? I haven't done anything for 90 minutes ever, <laughs> you know, except sleep. <laughs> so, uh, so you have to kind of think it through kind of from an engineering perspective and say, what am I trying to accomplish? Where am I going to put the money? Where am I not? And as you mentioned, uh, as we put that stuff together and put it in, uh, we made some durability choices. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one other thing I wanted to comment on. One of the things that I like the most about my house is I can walk through a door on the second floor and go into a mechanical room and there's all these systems and I can put my arms around them. I can walk right up to them. They're illuminated. It's an air conditioned room. Mm -hmm. I can do whatever work I need to do on it. I can do whatever maintenance. I mean, when, when, when HVAC techs come to my house, uh, they're just like, Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, they said, "What? Where did this come from?" We're used to stuffing them into hot attics in the corner where you can barely reach it. Oh yeah, and imagine sending those people into attics, unair conditioned attics in the summer. Mm, terrible. So yeah, a real mechanical room is amazing. Yeah, you know, it's like that's one thing I did spend more money on because mm -hmm. you could have turned that into more square feet in that oh, house yeah, for sure. Um, but anyway, so I, I'd put a plug in for that because. It allows me or whoever I have working on these to be very efficient, to do the work that needs to be done, to take care of these. Uh, for example, I wonder how many of the listeners here have a contract with their uh, mechanical contractor to come in in the spring and inspect their systems, check them, check the Freon on the air conditioners, uh, just 
make sure everything's running correctly. They put their meters on them. They check the startup capacitors because mm-hmm. uh, those go out all the time in Texas. Very few people do that, Steve. Right, and it costs like. I can't remember. It may it may be 150 bucks a system, so it's mm-hmm. 300 bucks. They're going to come back for that price, and they're going to check the heaters in the fall. Mm-hmm. And if you do have a problem with the system, uh, outside of that, they give you a 10 percent discount That's on the service cool. call. That's pretty cool. So. Um, why wouldn't you do that? And, yep. and that's kind of one of my beefs is the way people take care of homes and that, durability and maintenance. That preventative maintenance just doesn't happen very often, does it? Well, it doesn't. And um, I don't know why, because it is this huge investment you have called a house needs to be taken care of. And uh, whether you're talking about exterminators or uh, cleaning it on the outside or uh, fixing anything that has that has broken or succumbed to whatever the elements have dealt out on it. Yep. Uh, I just see too many houses. You and I see this almost constantly. Uh, and we do it even on houses we've built where people take them and we offer to show them how we want them to be serviced. And some of our clients uh, let us do that for them and others, they let the house decay. Yeah. You, sure. you, you can't own a home and not have a line item in your budget for maintenance activities on it. You're going to have maintenance. And if you do it, you're going to really be happier with that home. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Steve, such a good topic, man. Let's wrap it up. Uh, We talked today about balancing that cost and performance. And I think we threw out some good ideas of how to do that. I think this probably deserves a follow-up as we continue to have those discussions about how to balance, uh, especially in today's day and age, those cost increases that we're seeing uh, with lumber that's gone up quite a bit. Uh, we talked about that on recent podcasts. There's a lot to think about when it comes to building a well-built house that's affordable. And I think that, that that would be a good future discussion for you and I, or let's think about who else could help us on the podcast too in the future on that. But Steve, thank you so much for taking an hour and a half out of your afternoon to be on the podcast with me. Um, guys, thank you for joining us for today's podcast. You know, we've been film, we've been uh, filming these. These are uh, available to watch over on buildshownetwork.com if you're interested in the video version of this. Uh, and then, of course, this podcast comes out on all the major platforms, on iTunes and iHeartRadio and all those places. But big thanks again to Steve Leeson for joining me. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, guys. Every single Friday, we've got a new Build Show podcast. From the Rockwell Studios here in Austin, Texas, I'm your host, Matt Reisinger. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.